Our passage today is in Matthew chapter 5, verses 42 through 46. Give to the one who begs from you, and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You therefore must be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. May God bless the reading of his word. Please be seated. Well, good morning again. Everybody made it through the ice, I see. Right? That was looked like a, a threat yesterday a bit, didn't it? Well, I grew up in northern Illinois, so this stuff is this stuff is pretty little for <laughs> how I grew up. But uh, in any case, are you happy today? Good, 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 good. Can we, um, we don't do this, but it's the first Sunday of the year. Let's stand up together and say the Lord's Prayer together, okay? Let's do that. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Okay, please be seated. Thank you for, for, for doing that together. Uh, so today, we're going to start a sermon series on the words of Jesus. And um, I think it's probably been years since I preached through a topical series rather than through a book of the Bible. Those of you who are here five and six and seven years ago, remember, we went through Isaiah for three years, right? So, so this, this is not uh, the, the, the main thing that we do here, but I felt like that's what God would have us to do. So today, we're studying the verse 544 of Matthew, where Jesus says, love your enemies. Now, I believe that this is something that's very deeply needed today, both here in America and with our thinking abroad, right? And, and I also believe that this is perhaps the hardest religious or most difficult religious precept in any religion. Now, we know there's only one true religion, right? Right? Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, right? And believing in him, right? But we also have to be aware that there's millions and actually billions of people in other religions, and Buddhism, Hinduism, Islam, etc. I won't name them all. There's a lot of Sikhs. There's a lot of Sikhs in Northern Virginia, right? But this precept is, is very difficult. I, and I, I don't think, and you know, before I became a Christian at 28, I studied a lot of other religions uh, in high school and college. And I don't think that, that other religions have anything quite like this, right? Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Pray for those who want to hurt you, right? Pray for those who want to damage you. Pray for those who want to come after you and even your family, Right? This, this is difficult stuff. One thing I love about the words of Jesus is that whatever Jesus said was good. 
you don't have to wonder about it, right? If I, if I, read, a, if I read a famous author, if I read Hawthorne, or I read Tolstoy, or I read Dostoevsky, or I read Shakespeare, or I read Hemingway, right? I have to, even though they're proven authors in their cultures through history, I have to wonder about whether what they're saying is good and right. But with Jesus Christ, there's no wondering, right? Jesus Christ is God the Son. What he says is always true, is always good, is always right, right? And so that self-certainty about his words and its objective certainty as well allows me to, and you, to take with God the Holy Spirit in us, to take the truth in and then start to live it, right? In a way that we cannot just live out other things. You might even study a professional field. You might study engineering. You might study accounting. You might, you, you might study chemistry or something. And, and, and you'll come across a theory or a hypothesis, right? And depending on the, or math, you might, you know, you might be an expert at math. And depending on the level that you're at, you might actually see, well, there could be a problem with this hypothesis. I might be required to use it in my field, but there could be something missing here, right? But not so with Jesus, Everything, he says, is good and right and true. So then we come to something like this, which goes against all naturalistic thinking. Right? It has a lot of shock value. Love your enemies. Folks, to err is human. You may listen to a politician, and you may agree with most of what they say, but, and most, most of it might be right, but there might be some, something they say, you're like, okay, well, that's garbage. I'm, I'm discarding that. I mean, that's not something for me to live with or with, live by. Or let's say you listen to your pastor or even to your favorite pastor, the best preaching pastor in the United States, say, the, the one you think is best. Maybe most of what they say is right. Maybe even 95% or 97% is right. But you know when you listen, uh, 5% or 3%, that wasn't quite right. What this guy said right there it just wasn't quite right. Folks, that's life. To err is human. As a poet named Pope said, people are fallible. By the way, no theological system, no denomination, no professor, no pastor or theologian is 100% right. No, not one except Jesus. We're starting a series today about the words of Jesus, which will run until, until Easter, basically. One year I read the Catholic Catechism, which is uh, Catholicism's book of official teaching. It's huge. It's about the size of the Bible. It's extremely well-written. The top Catholic scholars are absolutely first rate, better than most denominations, frankly, just because they've got over a billion people to draw draw from, and you've got guys who speak seven, eight, ten languages, and they're going to know how to use language, right? Another year, I read John Calvin. His amount of writing is also huge. Another year, I read Luther, and another year, I read Wesley. In another year, I read Bunyan, and another year, the Westminster Confession, and another year, the ba- read and studied the Baptist faith and message, and so on, and so on, and so forth. You know, the difference between all of these people, and all of these denominations, and all of these books and statements in terms of cr- Christian teaching or Christian doctrine, one is 98% right. One is 96% right. One is 94% right. One is 92% right. But they're all focused on Christ, and they all believe in God. But because of history, or church practice, or reason, or bias, or preferences, some make more errors than others. But they all focus on Christ, and by God's grace, they all agree on most things of the faith. Like that Jesus Christ is God the Son. Like the virgin birth. Like the Trinity and on and on. 
around many points of orthodoxy, they all agree. These Christian groups and people have much more in common than they do differences. But, but, and this is important, they all make mistakes. They all err. We make mistakes, we err. I make mistakes, I err. But not Jesus. But not Jesus. Not Jesus Christ. He doesn't make mistakes. He doesn't err. Jesus Christ is God the Son. Jesus Christ is the Lord and Savior. He is perfect. His words are always good. His words are always right. Will you pray with me one more time? Lord, thank you. Thank you for allowing us to have and to study the words of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, codified in Scripture. For time memorial, we'll have them, right? The world will pass away and everything in it, but not the words of Jesus. So, Lord, it doesn't matter if there's an atom bomb. It doesn't matter if there's a hurricane. It doesn't matter if, 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 if we get to, into World War III. The words of Jesus Christ will still stand eternal. Lord, help us to wor- learn these words, the words that you've given us. Jesus Christ is the bread of life. Help us to learn these words because these words are life and they are spirit as he teaches us. We thank you for it, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're, we're thinking about Jesus' words today in Matthew 5.44. So let's look there together. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. This is a stunning statement. Now, I think one of the problems we have, many of us, I hope nobody will take this the wrong way. I think one of the problems we have, many of us, is that we've been Christians too long. We grew up in the church. We started learning all these things that Jesus said when we were young or little. Not me. I, I, you know, I've been a Christian 25 years now. 26. I'm almost double nickel. Somebody told me that the other day. So, the longer we're in the church, the more we hear these things, maybe sometimes we forget just how stunning these words are. This is a stunning statement. Jesus really cuts right to it, doesn't he? He knows us, right? He's got us. We don't want to do it. If you tell me that you naturally want to love your enemies, I'm going to look at you and say, you're a liar. Okay? I'm going to say, you don't really understand what an enemy is. You don't really understand that many countries live by vendetta and that it passes not just on from, you know, me and Keith, but, you know, somebody killed the grandfather and they're still going to come after you later. There are serious enemies out there in the world. So it's almost like nails on the chalkboard The thought of loving and forgiving our enemies, our worst enemies. So I'm just gonna try, I'm just trying to, just trying to maybe hopefully get you outside the box a little bit today. I hope nobody will take offense at this. But imagine the thought of the Ukrainians forgiving and loving the Russians. Or the thought of the Jews. Loving and forgiving Hamas in 2023 and 2024. Or the thought of the British forgiving the French for the hundred years between 13, hundred years war between 1337 and 1453. You know, the British and the French are in NATO together, but the British still don't trust the French. I mean, If you understand politics at all, you get that, right? Or the thought of the Chinese forgiving the Japanese for their atrocities in World War II, killing over 20 million civilians between 1937 and 1945. 
or the thought of Native American peoples in the territory of Mexico for giving Cortez and Spain for bringing disease to the continent in the 16th century. Approximately 8 million died of smallpox alone. The total numbers of disease are much, much higher. They're staggering. So I could go on and on. Hun tribes, like the Visigoths and Vandals, piled dead bodies around the walls of cities in the ancient Roman Empire to give the inhabitants the smell of the fear of death. And then the Hun warriors climbed over those dead bodies, using them as a kind of stairway or ladder to raid the Roman cities and slaughter everyone inside. But Jesus says, love your enemies. Jesus says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Pray for those who want to hurt you. Pray for those who want to kill you. How can this be a universal maxim for mankind? How can this even be a universal maxim for Christians? How can you love those who would kill your parents and children? Well, that's the end of the sermon. Go home and figure it out. I'm kidding. If I was a politician, that might be the answer. Or I'd just say, give us justice. Give us justice, right? Maybe an eye for an eye, maybe I'd say that. I think Jesus made what that truly means clear, right? As Christians, how can we love our worst, most aggressive, most ignorant, excuse me, enemies? Through mercy, grace, and forgiveness. Through mercy, grace, and forgiveness. Mercy and forgiveness are aspects of love, pure and simple. When I exercise mercy towards someone, I also exercise love. When I practice and exercise forgiveness towards someone, I also exercise love. The daily practice, brothers and sisters, hey, you're here, you're, you're, you're in the pews. I don't like that. I don't like that phrase, pew warmer, by the way. I don't think there's a single pew warmer here, right? If you're a pew warmer, you probably don't come to this church, right? Probably go somewhere where you can sneak in and out once every five and six weeks and nobody misses it, right? Everybody here wants to follow Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Everybody here who's an adult and a mature Christian for sure, right? The daily practice of mercy and forgiveness are essential to loving others. The practice of forgiveness is also essential to love, and forgiving others shows that you recognize that God has forgiven you, right? That God has forgiven you. God has forgiven you. You now love others. You forgive them, right? So, so please turn to Matthew 18, 21. We're going to read 21 through 35. Now, let's see, let's see if I can read a little better today than, than last week, okay? Sorry about that. Now, let me preface this by saying, one of the main ways, one of the main ways that individuals become enemies is by not forgiving each other. Okay, let's, let's do the math here. This is 5 minus 2 equals 3. One of the main ways that people become enemies is by not forgiving each other. Right? One of the main ways that nations become enemies is by not forgiving, forgiving each other. Right? We've, we've got some Korean brothers and sisters here. In Korea, they're still mad at Japan for what went down in World War II. I mean, that's just reality, right? 
And there's a lot of countries like this, right? Uh, Israel and some of the other countries have not forgiven each other around them, and they've been after each other for centuries, or, you know, well, Israel's reformed in 1947, but the peoples have been at odds with each other for, for not just centuries, for millennia, right? And there hasn't been forgiveness, right? So, so, so just bear, bear with me here, okay, in this connection, right? So first, verse 21, then Peter came up and said to him, to Christ, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Whoa, you know, Peter, Peter's the man, okay? Peter's a doer, right? The idea to a Jew at the time of forgiving somebody seven times, you can forget about that. Two or three times was a big number. Seven times, man, what, what, what Peter is saying is, look at me, I can forgive seven times, right? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 70 Seven, 70 times seven. I don't know why this says 77, but whatever. Uh, number 23. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven, I mean, it's, it's a, a, an infinite amount. Uh, you know, keep going is what it means, right? Verse 23. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be the kingdom of heaven, right? Right? Your, your, your goal in this life is to walk in the kingdom. Right, your goal, your goal, your goal. If you have a, if you have a, a Christian faith and a Christian goal, your Christian goal, as you're walking here on planet Earth, doing your your pilgrimage, is to actually to walk, following Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior in the kingdom. Okay, so therefore, the kingdom may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. Dulos, verse twenty four. When he began to settle. One was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. This is Bill Gates' money. Okay? This, this is uh, Elon Musk money, right? We don't have it, right? It's billions in today's dollars. It's billions. Verse 25. And, and he couldn't pay. The servant couldn't pay. The servant couldn't pay billions. So his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had, so see, don't get in debt. We talked about that last week. And all that he had, and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, begging his Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity, out of mercy for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave the debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. Now, this is something that can be paid. This is like five, six thousand bucks, maybe in today's dollars, right? If if you're going to go to jail, or 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 or, or your family's going to be sold, you're going to be sold. You're going to you know you're going to find five, six thousand bucks one way or another, right? You're not going to find billions. You're going to find five, six thousand. Can you go back for one second? You're going to find five, six thousand who owed him a hundred denarii, right? Next slide, please. Sorry about that. So seizing him, the same servant who was forgiven the, the monster debt began to choke him. You know, he grabbed him by the throat saying, pay me what you owe, right? See, he didn't get the lesson, right? So his fellow servant fell down and begged him, have patience with me and I'll pay you. He did the same thing that the servant did to his master. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master, you know, the Lord, by the way, then his master summoned him and said to him, you could even translate that, Lord, from Greek, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me, and should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant, as I had mercy on you? And in his anger, in his orge, in Greek, in his orge, in his anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debts. 
So also, and here's the punchline, so also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you, everyone, not some, every one of you, if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. So what's the lesson? What's the spiritual lesson? What's the kingdom lesson? The lesson is God in Christ forgave you everything. He forgave you a debt and a sin debt that cannot be repaid. That is impossible for any human being to pay. Even Paul couldn't pay it on his own. Right? Even Peter, the great apostle Peter, couldn't pay it on his own. No human being, no one can save themselves. No one can get rid of their own sin sin debt. No one under the auspices of Buddhism or Islam or Hinduism, any other religion, can get rid of their sin debt to God. The only way is through Jesus Christ. Right? But, and I say but hesitantly, because I don't want to make this work, so I don't want to sound that way. But when God forgives you everything, it comes along with this. He also expects you to forgive others everything. And if not, you're not walking in the kingdom. Right? And so remember, so that one of the main ways that we make enemies, whether people, communities, in the church, in corporations, in parties, in nations, you, 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 you do it however you want to do the math, right? The, one of the main ways we make enemies is by not forgiving people. Right, really, actually, most people that you don't like, you, you know, you got, let's be honest. You're like, is there a person here who can say to themselves, there's not a single person on this earth I don't like? I don't know. If you can raise your hand to that, come see, come see me after service and tell me your secret. Right, because I don't know how you do it. I'm going to try to figure that out. Right, I'm going to try to learn from you. Right? Every single person probably doesn't like somebody, right? Every single person's probably at odds to some extent or another, to some degree or another with other people. And if it goes far enough, they become an enemy. You know what's at the root core of all of that? Unforgiveness, right? Right, when the Nazi party was rising to power in the early 30s, right? Right? They thought the Jews were behind their economic problems. That's what they thought, right? You can go watch Hitler videos from 33 and 35 if you want to find that out, right? They were also upset from World War I because they had huge reparations to pay after World War I. So consequently, they were still angry and upset. As a collective people, they had not forgiven, and so they launched into militarism. They said, okay, we'll take. We'll take what's ours. It's that simple. It's that simple. Right? So whether individual or corporate, without forgiveness, we turn people into enemies over time. Hating others, hurting others, making others into enemies shows not only a lack of forgiveness, it shows also that you have not followed your duty to God, to love others. How can you follow Christ when your enemy has you at the point of his sword? That's a hard one, right? Remember, Churchill wouldn't negotiate with Mussolini, with the Nazis, right? Because Churchill thought, you don't negotiate when your head is in the mouth of a tiger, right? So he said, there's no use negotiating with them now even though his military cabinet wanted to, right? But how can you, and I love Churchill, but how can you forgive 
When your enemy has you at the point of the sword, please turn to Matthew 26, 47 through 52. While he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a great crowd with swords and clubs. I mean, the sword was the most powerful weapon of the day, right? A great, you know, as was, you know, the musket at the time of the Revolutionary War. Look, keep in mind, when the Founding Fathers gave us the right to bear arms, they gave us the right to the most powerful weapon at the time, right? Right? One of the twelve with him, a great crowd with swords and clubs, came from the chief priest, the head priest, head priest, and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, right, Judas? The one I will kiss is the man. Seize him. Hence we get the, the word Judas, the phrase Judas kiss. Verse 49. And he came up to Jesus at once and said, Greetings, Ravi. And he kissed him. Jesus said to him, friend, do what you came to do. Wow. Jesus is a lot calmer than me. I mean, I'm like, I'm balling up my fist at that moment, probably. Jesus said to him, friend, do what you came to do. Then they came up and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. Oh, and here's, here comes Peter, zealous Peter. I love Peter. I mean, I just, I, you know, you'll never convince me otherwise. P- Peter, he's the guy. Verse verse 51, and behold, one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword, it was Peter, and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, put your sword back into its place. Why? For all who take the sword will perish by the sword. So firstly, through faith and reason, Those who take the sword will perish by the sword. In other words, violence begets greater violence. Even today, Israel may be winning the battle, but losing the war in the long term. We must be careful to pay attention to the actual words of Jesus. Jesus, the King of Israel. There are negative consequences for us when we fight our enemies. Right? It's one thing even to have enemies. It's another thing to count the cost of what a fight with them actually, actually would be. There are negative consequences for us when we fight our enemies. Going further, there are positive benefits when we love our enemies. Please turn to, so right now I'm giving you a reason. You know, we, we are reasonable creatures. I'm giving you reason to love your enemies. Please turn to 1 Peter 3 9. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For to this you were called, notice the last part, that you may obtain a blessing. God, the author of life and the true judge, he will square things. He will compensate evildoers properly. We need only inherit the blessing from him. Another benefit can be found in 1 Peter 2, 21 to 24. Look with me there. For to to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. You got it? When we love our enemies, when we don't strike back, when we turn the other cheek, we get to suffer with Christ. Oh, I know the flesh doesn't like to suffer. I get that. But spiritually, we get to suffer with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, 
who bore the sins of the world and who he himself did not strike back. Right? And as we suffer with him, following him, it brings glory to God. Glory to God. And as glory goes to God, we're the beneficiaries, small g, of that glory. Another help in learning to love our enemies is realizing that this life is transient and fleeting. Uh, How many here are over 30? Okay, most. Okay, wait a second. How How many here are between, we'll see if there's anybody, between 25 and 30? Okay, a couple. Do you, up there in the balcony, you can answer or not. If you don't answer, I'm going to put words in your mouth. Do you feel like your life is transient and fleeting? Okay. I kind of got, uh, I got, I kinda got a nod, yes, maybe. Okay, good. Well, so, so we have a very smart young lady up there. Right? Let me tell you, generally speaking, I don't believe that 20, 25-year-olds, 30-year-olds are thinking about their lives being, I didn't anyway, maybe I'm dumb, are thinking about their lives being transient and fleeting. I mean, this is something we start thinking about, you know, when our knees start to hurt, right? (laughs) I mean, this is something we start thinking about when our back starts to hurt. This is something we start thinking about when we start to have medical problems, right? Because now we see, oh, wait a second, right? This stuff could get worse, right? And then we start thinking, wait a second, you know, when I was 20, I hadn't, I hadn't seen too many people die. I mean, I saw my mom die at 18, the worst experience of my life up to that time. But, but I, I hadn't, I had, I, she's the only one I'd seen die, right? But by 45, after I'd been a pastor for six, seven years, I'd seen maybe over 100 people die. I mean, I'm starting to realize pretty quick, life is fleeting, and our bodies are breaking down. You know, we're getting to 70 and 80. We see our friends die. You know, my grandpa who served in World War II in the Navy, he had a birthday. I think I told some of this once. He had a, he had a, he had a, he had a, he's a popular guy, you know, him and grandma. He, he had a, he had a, he had a, like a, a something like a, a, 45th or 50th wedding anniversary, that kind of thing, when he was maybe 70, 75, I don't remember exactly. But there's 500 people there, right? Oh, then the 65-year wedding anniversary. He lived in 94, you know. All these guys who served in World War II somehow, they're living forever. I, I, you know, they they just, I mean, they, they just, these guys eat nails, right? Roll Call called them the greatest generation, right? But but the 65-year party, there were no 500 people there. There were about 50 people there. All his friends had died. Right? So grandpa knows, or he knew before he passed on, that life is transient and fleeting. This life is transient and fleeting. Your home is in heaven. Now, this might make you sad that you're you know, especially if you're not a Christian, it's going to make you sad that, that this life is transient and fleeting. But if you're a Christian, right, then you realize something else. And you realize life is fleeting and you're getting older. No one here, nobody, can do something catastrophic to you. Impossible. Jesus says, fear not he who can destroy the body, but him who can destroy body and soul in hell. In other words, fear God only. Thinking about our enemies today, love our enemies, agape, this word's agape in our verse, on the root agape, includes not only the idea of moral love, but even the idea of welcoming and entertaining, right? When you hear love your enemies, you're probably thinking, as we started this sermon, you're probably thinking what's going on up here and in here. Well, that's part of it, but it's not the whole thing. Love your enemies here, includes action. It includes inviting your enemies over to your house. It includes making your enemies dinner. 
It includes sitting down and sharing what you have with your enemies. It includes caring for your enemies. That's what the verse is teaching, right? Love is an action, not just a feeling. Uh, look at Romans 12.20. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, Paul says, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. Right? Now, he says, for by so, so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Um, some people interpret that as trying to enrage him. I, I don't interpret it that way. Right? But I'm not going to go into that. Let's, I'm just going to put, because I, I don't want to get into a sidetrack. Let's just concentrate on the precept that, that, that Paul is teaching here. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him the, something to drink. Hospitality. Paul is learning from Jesus. Love is an action. Feed those who hate you. The world could learn from this today. And remember that Christ has done what he calls you to do. This is very important for your encouragement. Christ has done what he calls you to do. He prayed for them that despised and persecuted him. As he was hung up on the cross, and he hung there suffering in enormous agony. And he was fully human, so he felt all the pain in enormous agony. And keep in mind, the way that the Romans did this cross, the reason they did it was because it inflicted the greatest amount of pain and suffering, right? There's a lot of ways to kill somebody, right? You can chop their head off, right? The French mastered that with a guillotine right, to their criminals. But the way that you can inflict the absolute most pain is up on that cross, and you draw it out. So as, as Jesus is up there, this being tortured on the cross, dying on the cross, he died and then he rose, but dying on the cross, he called out to the Father, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So Jesus... Jesus taught us not just by his words to love our enemies, but also by his example. Word and deed is how theologians say it today. Thus, we love our enemies like Christ, even in death and suffering. Concluding then, let me say this. If you love your enemies, it will not only show that you're a Christian, it will show that, but in truth, now listen very carefully, this might be one of the most important things for your life here today in America. But in truth, if you love your enemies, if you love your enemies, you will have peace inside. You'll have peace inside. Do you ever have angst inside? Do you ever have anger inside? Do you ever have discombobulation inside? If you love your enemies in Christ, that will contribute to having peace inside the peace of Christ. But if you hate your enemies, you know what you'll have inside? Anger and hate. This is so simple a child could understand it, right? This is 2 plus 2 equals 4. This is even 5 minus 2 equals 3, right? If you have anger inside, if, Keith, I don't like you, right? That's not true. It could be. <laughs> it could be true that Keith doesn't like me too, right? Right? If I have anger inside towards Keith, you know what that makes me? That makes me angry. That makes me angry inside. If I have love towards Keith, even if he is my enemy, you know what that makes me have inside? Love. Peace. Right? Jesus is teaching us, brothers and sisters, Jesus is teaching us how to live, especially in the church, especially in his body, especially as those who walk in the kingdom. It's not easy to follow Christ, and that's why I said today this is possibly the hardest religious precept in any religion to follow. If you, if you take it to the maximum, which I try, I tried to take you to the maximum today. Okay, maybe I failed with some of these examples and the historical stuff. I tried to take you to the maximum. It's not easy to follow Christ, especially in our verse today. No one should like war. No one should like torture. And it is completely unacceptable. 
No one should like slander or gossip. No one should like the stealing of property or theft. It makes sense naturalistically to hate those who do such things to us and to try to retaliate. Yet Christ teaches something deeper. Love, forgiveness, mercy, and grace. We all live by God's grace. Every single one of us. We all have that in common. Every single person on the planet, every single person on the planet doesn't have uh, Christianity in common, but every single person in the planet has the fact in common that they live by God's grace, common grace. Remember, Jesus says he makes the sun rise and fall on the just and unjust, right? All people live by grace, and at some level, even though they don't really get it, at some level they kind of intuit their dependency, right? Jesus teaches us to forgive other people, people created in his image, as we are forgiven. Jesus teaches us to walk in the kingdom with his perfect words, his good, right, and perfect words. Jesus Christ died for our sins and rose, and in the power of his resurrection, we too today can love our enemies. Let's close in prayer. Lord, Lord, you don't, you don't pamper and baby us. Lord, you, you, you give it to us straight. You teach us, even at the end of our verses today, it says that we must be perfect like our, our Father is perfect. We, 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 we follow you, Lord. We don't, because we have the Holy Spirit in us, and by your grace, even though we're very fallible people, we keep contending, we keep striving in faith and obedience to follow you. And, and this, is, this is one of the hardest things you teach us. You even had to drill it down on the great apostle Peter to get him to understand this. He, he asked you, what do I just forgive seven times? Lord, help us to love and forgive even our enemies, even those who've really hurt us bad. Lord, I pray here for anyone here today that has unresolved hurts in their heart that separate them from another person, especially if it's a family member, especially if it's an old friend, especially if it's a church member, especially if it's somebody that we're meant to be friends with, right? I pray that that hurt can be dissolved, that there will be forgiveness, and that, and that they'll no longer consider that person an enemy and if they do consider them an enemy, Lord, that they'll love them, they'll love that person anyway, just like your word teaches us. And, and through that love, perhaps the hurt will diminish and the relationship will improve, perhaps. But Lord, our goal is not to you know, impress others. Our goal is to follow you. So help us even to love our enemies whether we want to or not, and, and it is hard, Lord. Lord, thank you. That, thank you for your word. Thank you that whatever happens in this life, your word always remains. Your word is eternal. Lord, help us to walk in the king, kingdom living by your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.